huge welcome to Hamdi Ulukaya. Also, the q and A, I'm going to do it throughout the session, not at the end. So when you have relevant, short, punchy questions, you open the app, you go to this section, this session in the app, and you just click join q and A. And I'm going to take the questions as we go. And I just want to start by asking you the story. <laughs> you come to America. Can you just tell us about that first factory? The first factory, uh, by the way, Elliot, thank you. I'm so honored to be with you all. Um, I wish I had known about this a while ago. I would have come to every single one of them. Um, I am in my cheese plant, which my father encouraged me to do because I'm Kurdish, I'm from Turkey. And when my father came to visit one day, um, he said, they don't have good feta cheese here, why don't you make some? <laughs> and exactly the same way I laugh at him, I barely laugh at my father. And I said, like, did I, like, I didn't come 2,000 miles, 3,000 miles away from home to make exactly what I was making. So that's no way I'm doing that. But the short story, <coughs> to make the story short, I started this small cheese plant. I almost killed myself in it. Um, at the night, like around 6, 7 o'clock, um, I'm a messy person. My desk is always messy, even now. And I'm, once every 10 days or two weeks, I go through them. I clean them up. And I came across to this mail, like a junk mail, and said, fully equipped yogurt plant for sale. And I look at the back, and there were some pictures of the plant and the equipment, and just throw it into garbage can, continue smoking, drinking tea, whatever. About a half an hour later, for some reason, I went back into that, that pin, uh, the can, and I picked that ad and look at it, it's like now it's dirty. And I called the number, and the guy answered, um, a real estate agent in Utica, and he said, yeah, it's a plant, it's, in, it's closing, craft is closing, and I asked him the, the price. Um, he said it's $700,000. Now, I know dairy equipment, I see the fillers, I see tanks, there's no way this thing is $700,000. I mean, it's, it sounded very cheap to me. Uh, not that I had $700,000, but, you know. <laughs> so I decided to go visit it next day. Um, my cheese plant is in Johnstown, and this place is in South Edmiston, and there is no app to follow it, so it took me four hours to find it. And when I got into the factory, uh, a gentleman named Rich, who is the production manager, met me, and he, he gave me a tour uh, all around the factory. And there were about 45, 50, 55 people. They were closing the factory. They were making things ready, wrapping things up, turning off the lights. The first, um, the first thing came to my, my mind was how sad it was. It was very sad. There was this sadness in the environment. The second thing came to my mind was how amazing job these guys were doing closing this factory. They were paying attention to every single thing. And I said, who does that? Like, your job is about to be eliminated. This place, after 75, 80 years, is about to close. And it's done, it's finished, there's no more. And they all know it, but they were still trying to do their best to close the best possible way. Um, so when I left the factory, I immediately called my attorney. His name is Mario. I said to Mario, Mario, I found a yogurt plant. It's for sale. It's not very expensive. I want to buy it. So he says, wait, 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 wait. He says, tell me one more time. I keep telling him, I keep telling him it's a broken English, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mario said, see, see they said, the largest food company in the country, Kraft, is closing this factory. And they're getting out of the yogurt business. Who the fuck are you? Like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> like that kind of conversation, right? Uh, and, I, and I said, yeah, you're right. I mean, <laughs> seriously. So I called him back in the same drive again. I said, no, Mario, there's something there. I, I really think that. He says, how much is it? 700,000. He says, you don't have the money. 
you have not paid me in the last six months. <laughs> and there is no way you're getting that kind of money. Like your cheese plant is worthless. You haven't made money yet. And uh, that was my visit and leaving from the plant. There was no reason to think that this plant will worth anything or something can be done with this plant or anything like that. I had no plan or idea. It was just pure feeling walking in that place. I felt like there's something here. And later on, I read, I read this line from Rumi. He said, when there is a ruin, there's a treasure. And treasure for me was the people. I think those people who were giving their best to it and the guy who showed me the factory made me convinced that even though this is the end, there's something amazing in here. If you see it, you should stay for, you should stay for it. And that's what I did. So how many years ago was that? That is 2000, January of 2005. And so then what happened? Then, <laughs> then the shit started happening. Got and it. I, you, yeah. You got an SBA loan. I got an SBA loan. This how do you, you, you called the SBA? You sent, what, how, how did you get an SBA loan? There's this guy, John Ryder and uh, Pat Mucci. Pat Mucci passed away. These are the two heavenly bankers I've ever met in my life and I have not met since. Um, they were small bank, small bank, key banks, regional salespeople. And Pat Mucci came to me and says, you look like you're into something here. Um, there is this thing, it's called SBA loan. Uh, program is 401 something, I don't remember, 100%. And they said, if we get the SBA to tell us we guarantee the loan 50%, we think we can get the rest. You have to come up with 10% and we get the 40%. We can get this done. So why don't you write a business uh, uh, plan? <laughs> this first business plan I've ever written in my life. Um, and Pat got it. Pat got me the loan, uh, $700,000 plus $300,000 for everything else. And August of 2005, I had the key for this factory. The first thing I did is to hire five of the uh, 55 people from that plant. So it's Maria, Rich, Mike, Frank, um, me, so we were five. And the first board meeting was August 17, 2005, in an office where the chairs were all over the place and the water is dripping, you know, the fan, this old, it's, it's literally from the movie. And Mike looks at me and says, Mike, so what do we do now? So these are my first five employees, right? And these guys, they had never seen a Turkish guy before. Um, and, and these five employees, you had to let they, they, you had to let go, or they let go of the, the other, the original yeah. 50, and you made a commitment, you hired five back. Yeah, so I asked the manager, I said, if I one day wanted to bring this plant back to life, tell me five people I should hire. And he said, you need to get Maria, because Maria knows everybody, suppliers, she knows all the office things and everything else. You need to get Rich, because Rich is the production guy who knows everything about the production. You need to get Frank, he runs the wastewater plant, because without the wastewater side, you cannot run this. There's no city wastewater, it's middle of nowhere. And you need to get Mike, because Mike has been in this plant for 20, what, 30 years, retired, came back. He knows every pipe, every wire, everything. He can fix anything, he can make you. So you need to get him. I said, so, okay, so we got them all, all of those four, and myself. And the first board meeting, I call it board meeting, the first meeting, they're looking at me. So Mike says, Hamdi, so what do we do now? The what bothered me the most was the paint outside. It was white in, who knows, maybe in the 60s and 50s, but it's dark now, it's black, and I think I can fix that. So I said to Mike and the others, and I said, we're going to go to the hardware store, we're gonna get some white paint and some other paint and we're going to paint the walls outside. So <laughs> I think they were like, is this guy real or what? So, and I didn't do it to make a case or to be funny or to, like I, I had no statement making mentality at that time. I'm just, the, the only thing come to my mind, Elliot, is 
today, I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I have no plan, I have not much money, I have no experience. This is just, I'm following my guts, I got in here. The only thing I can come up with today to do <laughs> is to paint the walls outside. And <laughs> that summer, that summer we painted all those walls. So, and there was a bar across the street, it called Crocus, Cro Cro uh, Crocus. And this was a biker's bar, you know, the Harley biker's bar. And I've seen these guys in the movies, they're pretty scary, and they were just in front of me. And they were like, hey, you guys, you forgot that corner, ah, ha, 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 you know, paint that. <laughs> I mean, amount of joke that they were making to us while we are painting all those walls in the old factory. But that's what we did. All summer, um, that's 2005, the first cup of yogurt came out of that plant uh, in October 2007, the first chocolate. When you bought the plant, did you know you wanted to do no. yogurt? No. And so how did you have that idea? I started going into the stores. So you knew you had a plant to make something. But I didn't know. I knew. <laughs> I knew America did not have good yogurt as a consumer. That, because I, I, would, I couldn't find any yogurt. In Turkey, I mean, we eat shitload of yogurt. I mean, we eat a lot of yogurt. And it's good. And everybody has it. But you live in upstate New York, you go to stores, there's these cups, you don't know if they're yogurts or the candy or whatever the hell they are. And as a consumer, as someone who wants to eat, you, I couldn't find it. So I, I, do, I did think that yogurt needed, but there was this thing, that people were saying that Americans will not eat yogurt unless it's very sweet, they don't like texture, they don't like acidity, they don't like this, they don't like that. And when I was going to New York, I would go to stores like Whole Foods or you know, specialty stores in all those places, and I was seeing these, you know, people were buying this yogurt like from Greece, you know, from other places. And I would wait and ask them, like, people like me, I understand, but people like you, why are you buying this? And, you know, uh, you know <laughs> the, and I would ask them, why are we buying this? And then I, turn out that I, I come to this understanding that it's not that Americans would not eat good yogurt, it just doesn't exist. And the manufacturers, they, they really believe in this lie, even though they knew it was a lie, because it was cheaper to make it. I was completely convinced. The question was, how do I make this? Because I don't want to make where the craft made it, craft made the shit, the, the briars. I wanted to make the real one. That meant I need to have a separator, I need to have a different filler, I need to have different process and all that kind of stuff. And I don't have a lot of money. So I started going into the junkyards of uh, dairy equipments. And there was one in Madison, Wisconsin. And I went to Chicago and I drove, drove from Chicago to Madison, Wisconsin to go to this secondary equipment dealer to buy this main equipment called separator where you feed the milk, yogurt, and then spins and spins and spins and turns the, takes the water out and makes it tick. If you buy new, it's about a year, million and a half. If you buy used, like that particular machine, he was asking for 50,000, which I can live with it. So I went there, and then the guy asked, the other guy says, hey, Pete, where was that show? They're talking with each other. They finally find it way out, you know, outside of the, uh, the warehouse. And then we're all looking at this, and he says, is it gonna work? It's been there for 25 years. <laughs> and in that drive from Chicago to Wisconsin, I don't know if any of you have done it. I, that was my first time. The only channel will work was a Christian channel in the radio. Like, you know, so I'm listening to this. I don't know if that's the reason, because they talk about shepherds and all that kind of stuff. I said, I found the name. I'm going to call this Chobani. And Chobani means shepherd in Turkish. And so I bought that $55,000 separator, went back to Chicago, went to my hotel room, looked at it. It was, you know, Chobani.com was available. So I got the separator, I got the brand. I was all set. All he did. <laughs> um, 
And I sometimes think that um, those four or five people painting those walls, you know, in that summer of 2005, two years from now, we're going to launch Chobani. We're going to launch yogurt here, it's called Chobani. And in uh, the, the, the minute we launch it, people are going to go crazy for this. People are going to love this. This is one of the most beautiful things ever been done. And we're, going to, we're not going to go to specialty stores. We're going to go to the heart of America where everybody shops. And we're going to make it you know, a really accessible price. And you know, 5,000 cases, 10,000 cases, 20,000 cases, five is going to become 10, 20, 100 people. This plant is going to be the largest yogurt plant in the East Coast, hack is going to be the largest brand in the country. We're going to pump one million cases out of yogurt here in five years. We're going to reach into billion dollars in sales. This whole town is going to change. You know this bar is? We're going to buy that bar. This is the, m <laughs> the most painful thing I've ever done. The guy charges us $300,000, that shit hole. And then we took that. <laughs> We're going to take that stuff. <laughs> And then we're going to build a massive warehouse in here. It's going to, in three months. And then we're going to put a bridge from the plant to the warehouse. And every 15 seconds, we're going to pump one pallet of yogurt from that plant through the bridge into the warehouse, ship all around the country. And we're going to do this all independently. We're not going to take a penny from anybody else. And we're going to hire refugees, or we're going to build one of the largest yogurt plants in the world in Idaho. So imagine if I would said all of those things. This is all going to happen in five years, right? So Mike probably would have told me, I think you're smoking something really, really heavy. Like, <laughs> there is no way this thing can happen. Do you understand to buy one filler? We only have one tiny little filler. It took me eight hours to pack 120 cases on October 2007. In order to be a billion dollar in sales, you have to have 30 fillers. And each filler, it takes one and a half years to build, another year to make it work. You need that old separator that you just bought from, from the junkyard. You need 10 times more in a faster separator, and you need 25 of them to be able to make that kind of volume. So logically, it doesn't make any sense. Logically impossible. Physically impossible. But the catch was, and I, I talk too much, um, that in that tiny town, with those five people, with the surrounding, between the anger or passion or love, whatever you call it, we found a way to elevate ourselves. We were not in a real world anymore. The real world input did not matter to us. We were just going to find a way to make this happen. And I became part of this whole thing. I became part of Mike and Maria and Rich, wherever I came from, that how people just closed things. They just left. And ordinary people paid, paid the price. And the decisions are made in a high tower offices and looking at the spreadsheets and cost, you know, cutting the cost and stuff like that. And I was just fed up with it. And I had never done anything like this before. I had never been going to business school. I never knew anyone amazing entrepreneurs in community like this. I had never worked anywhere else other than the small cheese plant. I never had anyone was part of this that had done this before. So we are in a completely outside of this whole world. And we worked together. Um, I have seen heroes. I had seen iron fist, heart, passion from ordinary people. And then I had seen the community start coming in, coming in, coming in, being part of this dream. And I never walked in there, even today, as an owner, as a founder, I always walked in there as part of them. And it has been the, one of the most amazing journey of my life. Yeah. 
So after you got the SBA loan and you had five people that painted the walls and you went to Madison, Wisconsin and you got the website and you, you got the name, what happened in the, in the 18 months or the two years before you launched? You had no revenues. How did you get the $55,000 and how did you survive those 18 months? What, what happened in that period? Very good question. So I had about two, three hundred thousand um, dollars. And I've been very, very careful about those things. So I got to work. I have a yogurt maker, Mustafa and I, we start making yogurt in the lab, in the kitchen. Um, I went to Turkey, I went to Greece. The problem with it is you make a yogurt and, and I, I, I wasn't going to use any stabilizers or you know, preservatives and anything like that. I wanted to keep it simple, I wanted to keep it natural. Um, if you use the right cultures and right mixings and all that kind of stuff, it might be okay for the first week and two weeks and three weeks, and then on the 30th day and 45th day, it could go down south. So whatever you make now, you might, it might take you two months to find out if you have done it right or not. So it took me two years to perfect the recipe, like two years. And those two years, I never left the factory. Every day I was in the factory playing with it. Every what day. time would you arrive and what time would you leave? Oh, I mean, you know, I lived in Cooperstown, not for baseball. Um, I lived in Cooperstown because it was the middle town between, um, between South Edmiston and Nor uh, in Johnstown. So sometimes I would go to my cheese plant, sometimes I would go to the, this new old plant. Um, so, I mean, you know, sometimes nights, sometimes days, but the and at nights, would you sleep on the couch? Did you, that happened on? after we started the production. So after the start of the production, um, when we launched it, for example, I'll tell you something about the cups, Elliot. I mean, at that time I wanted to make this cup wider, 95 millimeter, because I didn't understand those, you know, like tiny cups, like opening. And it's just spoons that wasn't going in or anything like that. So I wanted to make it wider and it didn't exist. So I called all the cup manufacturers in the country, like all the big ones. Some would never call me back. Some will say, oh, we don't have that mold. In order for us to make that mold, you have to pay $250,000, which I don't have. Um, so everything was pushing me to give up on that cup idea, but I also wanted to sleeve it so I can have a beautiful strawberry pictures and beautiful graphics and all that kind of stuff. But I knew this was the only shot I had. And I was, um, I was very intense about it. And somebody said, there's a factory in Colombia, country, Colombia, that they are FDA approved and they have the mold and they can do the sleeve. Um, I said, okay, where is Colombia? So I, um, I went to Bogota, and I met the people there, and they showed me they can do it. I said, fine, you ship it to me. So we made a, and they were, op they were okay to start with the small guys. It's funny. And they said, well, while you're in here, do you want to go see Cartagena and see the sites of Colombia? They were very kind, nice people. So on my way back, it's a funny story. Um, on my way back, I landed in Miami, and, and as I came to the, uh, the custom, the officer said, yeah, come, come. And I said, okay. And he said, yeah, where are you coming from? I said, I'm coming from Colombia. So, okay, where did you go to Colombia for? I said, you know, um, I have an old factory in upstate New York. So I have a Turkish passport. And, you know, at that time, Turks were very known for their drugs and all that kind of stuff, you know. And I said, I have a plant in upstate New York and um, I'm going to start yogurt and I wanted to buy the cups from Bogota. <laughs> the guy was laughing, he said, this is the best story ever, you know. <laughs> where is the shit? Tell me where is the shit? I didn't understand what he was saying. I said, what, what, the cup or the yogurt? We can't. <laughs> He hold me there for two hours. He said, I, I still don't understand this shit, but you can go. <laughs> so we bought our cups from Colombia for two years. The only reason I went to Colombia because I could not find the 95 millimeter cup where I can sleeve 
and has a, a, a specific foil on top of it for strawberry and blueberry because it's not generic like it was before. And I want it to look nice. These were the details, I, I mean, every single detail like this, I spent time on. Um, once I launched it, the first customer was a kosher store in Long Island, a very small um, store. The second customer was ShopRite in New, in New Jersey. And the guys were asking $50,000 for each cup to be in the shelf. They call it slaughter fee. You know, shelf, yeah. and I don't have the money. So if I put five of the flavors in there, and this is early 2008, it will cost me $200,000, $300,000, and I don't have that kind of money. And we said, can you charge us as you sell? You know, once we sell it, we can charge every week so much of it. And the guy said, what if it doesn't sell? How am I going to get my money? We said, we're going to give you the factory if you don't. Is, and the guy said, is this real? I said, yeah. What am I going to do with the old, fa old factory? I said, I don't know. <laughs> like, I'm trying to find a solution here. And he, that buyer, I am still very good friend with that buyer. He let me put the cup in there. And a week later, he called me. He, a week or two weeks later, he called me back and he said, I don't know what you're putting into these cups. <laughs> I cannot keep it in the shelf. I have never seen anything like this. That was the moment. <laughs> That's good and bad. That was the moment I realized that I really overdid this. And that was the moment I realized that this was not going to be about making. I'm not sorry. This was not going to be about selling, because selling is going to be easier now. This, was going, this is going to be about if I can make it enough. And that was the time I decided that I had to be in the factory for a while, which I had been for the last two years before that, and I knew I was going to be staying in the factory. And when you, when you launched, how many team members were there? We were about 15 or 20, 15 or 20 factory workers in that time. And, and how, you know, at that time, and then maybe say in the year, two years after, how was your factory different? There's lots of factories and companies. So when we launched it, it was exactly the same, except we had to separate it from Wisconsin. We changed the fillers a little bit. And really we different in terms of the culture and the team. Yeah, they, 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 in the beginning, they did not believe me. Of course, it's like, who is this guy? What is he doing? Like, is this real, serious? Kraft just left after 90 years. Like, you know, it doesn't make any sense. I don't blame them for it. Um, in the second year, they were seeing me that I was always there. I was always there and I was always there. I think they felt sorry for me. They just, <laughs> they just wanted to do it with me. But once we launched it, once the star starts showing up and the you know, supermarkets and people are buying. And I did not leave the factory for the first five years, more than probably collection of a few weeks. I literally have a blackout, literally blackout, from 2008, early 2008, 2007, to 2012. I do not know what happened in the world. <laughs> Total dark. I am in the factory from morning to midnight to evening. And then when I wake up, people said, do you realize what you, just done, what you have just done? And I'm still eating pizza at Frank's, sleeping in a small bedroom, one bedroom apartment in, upstate, in, in Utica. I'm almost, I almost killed myself. Um, but I'm super focused, all in, outside of the whole universe in that factory, in that town, making yogurt, finding solutions. I mean, I turned toilets into offices. I found ways. I brought one time 150 trailers, used them as a cooler until I built my cooler. I mean, there is nothing outside of safety of the food, the taste of the food. Everything else was open to play with it. We, we, we had to find solutions. Um, and I saw people like one by one, one by one, one by one, and then the community start coming in, like in the beginning. Excitement. You know, it's like you're building back from the ashes. 
And I saw contractors, all the local contractors, the electric electricians, the truck drivers, the farmers, you know, everyone. And then local community, everybody. This became our thing. And we were going to kick ass. It would be just nothing was going to stop us. Um, the culture is the combination of everybody's good side. Everything that we had, I mean, we all have good and bad. We all have shortcomings and all that kind of stuff. That everything we were, we were going to give our best to this place. Because it was the new hope. It was the rewriting the history. It was about the forgotten people's real values. And, you know, you, you live in a small town. You know how that, what I'm talking about. And we were just going to find a way to do this. Um, and I was there with them. When, when were you able to look outside and start thinking about how you would help the community you were in? Besides hiring them, you had to have a story about a Little League field, for example. So that came from Cassie, who was my first assistant I've ever had. And she came to me, and we made a promise before we sold the first cup. 10% of everything that we make is going to go back to the community or the world, whatever it is, 10%. I mean, it was easy to write because we had no sales, right, at the time. <laughs> um, kidding aside, Cassie came and says the town said that their Little League field is, needs some help. And she showed me some pictures. It was just weird grass, some lines. And it was our second year. We were, the, we were, about, we were making some money now. Um, I mean, we were very profitable after we reached the 20,000 cases. I was extremely careful about every penny. I ran the company until it was $600 million in QuickBooks. I'm not kidding. I don't know if anybody here from the QuickBooks, but we sold $600 million worth of yogurt on QuickBooks. I, I wanted to keep everything extremely simple. And I did not want to make any mistakes. I did not want to make anything that I don't understand. And I don't know a lot of things at the time. I just wanted to understand everything I do in a very, very fast way until it gets so complicated. And we had no investors. We had no board. We had nothing. So we would make decisions very fast. We understand how much money we have. We knew what to do with this. We kept it extremely simple. We, we asked advice from anyone. But like nobody's there to give us advice, but hey, anyway, so, um, so I had to understand. So basically, it was Italian mom and pop store. That's how I run the whole thing. Now it's complicated. I don't understand everything about it. So, so when we made a little bit of money, Cassie said there is no field. And that was my opportunity. The first time since we started this journey is an opportunity to do something. And I said, Cassie, we're not just going to clean up this grass and put some lines. I remember I lived in Cooperstown. And I remember how kids were so excited about baseball. I don't understand the damn game. I, 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 have, I grew up playing football. But I, I saw those kids get so excited about the team and the game and then, you know, the balls. It reminded me, when I was a little boy, you know, how we were excited about playing soccer. And I said, I want to build a Little League baseball field in our town better than the one in Cooperstown. And I want every contractor in the town to come together and we built this together. And not only I wanted to build something fancy and l say, look what they've done. That's not the idea was. The idea was, how can we get all of us from what we have built to build something for our children. And my message, and softly was going to say, is our children deserve the best. And this community deserves the best. Everything else is the noise. And we did it. We built a baseball field with a, you know, lights. You could play at night with a scorecard, you know, the barbecue place and sitting area, all the ads and all that kind of stuff. It was the most beautiful thing. And I didn't open up in 4th of July uh, in 2010. And in my, first, my, in my life, first time I throw the first pitch. And 
the kids came to me and they were asking me to sign something and I didn't realize they were asking me to, to, to sign their shirts. It was the first time in my life anyone asked me to do that. And those kids will never forget how they felt that moment. And I will never forget how they feel. And hopefully some of those kids are going to make some other kids feel that special one day. But that was the moment. That was the first time I understood the meaning of the whole thing. It made sense to me at that moment. And we've been hooked ever since. What's an anti-CEO? Anti-CEO is, you know, I did the TED talk, um, you know, the anti-hero concept. I grew up in the mountains as a nomad. I, my background is we go up in the mountains, we make cheese and yogurt, we come back, you know, you're close to the stars, beautiful life, but it's not easy. So this, the business, the CEOs, the rich, is extremely distant from us. And not only that, it, to us, it's a dirt because of how they behave, how selfish they are, you know, all that kind of stuff. So for me, business, the world of business was far, far away. Far, far away. The magic happened when I came to the U.S. and especially went to upstate New York, and I saw a different side of businesses. I saw the community businesses, I saw the traditional businesses, people who make differences. And when I started it, I didn't realize it was all about money. It wasn't all about money, it was about this journey, entrepreneurship. You, you want to make things happen. You, might, you, you want to use God-given creativity, intelligence, knowledge, experience into something that you're extremely passionate about because you see something is wrong and it can be better. You see something is not right, it can be better. And in the end, money is a tool that you can make things happen with it. And when I saw that, that something that I hated the most became most magical tool for me. And I became very friendly with the money. And later on, I realized that it's not the business or the field of businesses or entrepreneurship, it's the CEOs or it's the board or it's the investors or whatever it is, is pushing them to have one purpose and one purpose only is to make money for the shareholder. That's the sole purpose of the business is to make money for, you know, value for the shareholder. And I realized that this actually happened 40, 50 years ago. Before that, it was all about stakeholders. It wasn't all about, you know, purpose of making value for the shareholder, but it's a stakeholder. Well, who are the stakeholders? Stakeholders are your employees, your community, the people that you serve, and greater humanity. These are all your stakeholders, including your shareholders. So the purpose of your business is to be responsible to your stakeholders. So anti-CEO is this, is to go from sole purpose of business to be a, 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 you know, responsible to shareholder, to all the stakeholders. You know, we have all these conversations that are happening around the, around the world. And I, I, you know, I, I got involved with, you know, good side of the businesses, getting them involved with refugees and all that kind of stuff. And we're talking about this. We are not even being close to be the reality because every, every business is in a high scale, large scale, is this, what is my return? That's the only thing that you look for. But people like entrepreneurs, like, like in this room, conscious, collective, understands that this cannot go any longer based on looking at the world and all the problems that we're, we're facing. I'm involved with the refugees, but look at all the other stuff that we're facing. Income inequality is in massive, massive place today. You know, you look at the world where poverty, you know, in, and, and, then, and then in the same country you look at the, you know, some of the rich ones, where the wealth is, is distributed. You look at all the issues that we're facing, gun violence, uh, income inequality, you know, gender, um, climate, you look at everything that we face, and you're looking at the government's failing and the NGO's you know, capability of being able to survive, you know, respond to all of these things, you have one 
institution can be extremely powerful and impact more than anybody else, and sustainable is business. And it's not, it cannot happen in the way of, here's I give $100 for girls in Africa and scholarship and all that kind of stuff. That's bullshit, that's check the box, that's, that's called corporate social responsibility. What it means is, every day when you act as a business, you have this consciousness of not only I'm not going to damage my stakeholder, I'm going to elevate my stakeholder. I'm going to make sure that everybody benefits from this. And that happens from the early on. And that, that's, that, that was the lucky for us that we started that way, that it's not in the side way, it's actually embedded what you do every single day. So when you went to your second factory, most companies, they look at, at cities to move and they ask, okay, I'll pick the city based on who can give me the best deal. What did, what did you ask I when said, you went? What, what can I do in this community? Is this a community I can be? What did you go meet with the commissioners or the mayor? How did it work? You, you uh, literally asked. Well, I, 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 I wanted to build a second plant and we knew it was going to be on the West Coast. We went to California, Utah, Arizona, a couple other states. And they said, you need to stop by in Idaho as well. I said, Idaho? Idaho. I, okay. So we went to Idaho, and the governor, you know, said hi. I mean, he has a big cowboy hat and boots, and, you know, he says hi to, to me in Turkish. And I spent like three days there, went to different, different communities. It was just this feeling. I knew this was a small community. Unemployment was very high, and the only industry they had was the potatoes. But I could understand this is, this is the people I can work with. We can, we can be part of this community. By the time I, I left, I told my, my, my team, this is where we're going to build. And they said, based on what? Like, we just, <laughs> you know, you're the first Turkish guy they have ever seen in here. I, mean, I, go, I said, no, no, I, I, I got the connection. I, I think this is the place we're going to do. I just came back from Idaho now, this morning. I was going to come last night, but I couldn't because all night we were making something very, very special, which we we're going to launch in January. And I was with the team loading, packing, and this morning, finally at 10 o'clock, it took us 18 hours. This has been a six months project. We finally finished it this morning. You go to Idaho today. Uh, we built 1.3 million square feet plant in there. The total investment that we've made in there is about close to 1.1 billion. We have about 1,200 people working there. The, 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 annual, uh, the annual impact Chobani has in the community is about three to five billion dollars. The city of Twin Falls is completely changed. I mean, you should see downtown. It's the coolest shit ever you've ever seen. And this is probably the, the most conservative state in the union. The red state, the second red state is also Idaho. And that's how, how it is. And, and outside of this political noise and all that kind of stuff, you know, I, I know what I think when it comes to social issues and all that kind of stuff. We don't agree with those things. But I have the best friends, colleagues. In the, in the dominant things, we agree. And what I realized is it's not that they are against this and that, it's about making a connections and having a conversation. And even if we don't agree, at least we don't hate each other, we sit down and share stories about families, and I trust them and they trust me. And Chobani became very Idaho. Like, you come and visit, you don't live too far. You'll see Chobani is very, very Idaho, as it is in upstate New York. The only reason this happened is no walls, no walls. This is not mine, it's everybody's. If everybody joins, it doesn't get less, it gets bigger. 
you can speak it. Do, do, you, do you personally sit with the, the team members in the factory and sit with the community, whether you're at the bar or restaurant, and talk about immigration, for example? And do yeah. you, are you getting into it and having real discussions? Yeah, and we do. And when we did that in the first time, it's a great question. I, I, I said, I know what you feel. I mean, Idaho government was the first one to ban refugees coming to, the, uh, coming to Idaho. But yet, Twin Falls in Idaho was one of the, one of the main refugee settlement area, just like in Utica. And 30% of our, our employees, not only in, 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 in upstate New York, but also in Idaho, are refugees from 15 different countries, 19 different countries, all kinds of people, <laughs> hundreds of them. And, and you know, there's, I, I, this, I'll give you an example. There's this two girls. Um, I don't know how much time we have. Um, there's three minutes. Three minutes. There's two girls. They lost their dad in Afghanistan, Taliban. And they were 13 and 14. And the mother thought that their danger is not over. They had to get out of here. And they, whatever they have money, they gave it to smugglers. And they asked them to ask the smuggler to take them to Ukraine, somewhere outside of Afghanistan. And as they come close to the border, the smuggler said to the girls and the mother, he says, I cannot take you all of you at once. So the mother needs to stay behind. I'm going to take the girls out to the, to the inside, and then I will come back and I will take the, uh, the, the mother. Mother screamed and said, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. I'm not separating from my girls says, without that, I'm not going to do it. And, of course, the girls go. He takes the girls and brings it to the town on the other side of the border. And then the mother never comes. He never brings the mother. So these two girls, here in this new place, no money, no one to know, just lost the mother, 13 and 14. They don't know anybody. I mean, it's just, so one Afghani family finds them on the street and says, well, you can stay in the kitchen for a day or two until you find out what you want to do, until your mother comes. They stay in that kitchen for four years. And one of them um, knew how to speak English a little bit, connected to a Jewish refugee organization in that town where they were working with the Jewish refugees in Ukraine to, to U.S., and she started working there as a volunteer. And the woman who connected with her is from Ohio, um, said, well, we should apply for them f through the UNHCR for the refugees to settle in the US as well. And in 2013, these two girls, and at the time now they were 17 and 18, um, they were settled in Twin Falls, Idaho, in the same week that we opened the factory. And the refugee settlement organization in Twin Falls and said, there's this new company here, they hire everybody. <laughs> and these two girls, they come to the plant. And they said, well, they have never worked anywhere in their life. They just came here, you know? And they said, okay, it's okay. And our people said, it's okay, we'll train you. It's okay, we'll do all that kind of stuff. So they came in, and the, the, when I was doing the walk, and I saw one girl in tears, in the first week, in tears, and comes and says, you can't talk, she's, 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 I know she's trying to say something, but she, her tears is not allowing to be able to say it. And I push everybody out, I said, sister, relax, take your time. Tell me what you need to tell me. And she tell me, my sister is not right here right now because she's in the other line, but um, thank you. Um, she's, she just wanted to cry, I think. And these two girls, from that moment to a year ago, they got job, they got permanent job, they got more comfortable, 
they got to rent a place, an apartment, and then they got another rental apartment, they made it bigger. I did not give them anything. Just provide them work. That's it. And train them. Just we do it for everybody else. Because I don't believe in handout. Of course, it's a community that we must take care of each other if somebody's in trouble, but job is enough. That's what they want. Opportunity for them to shine. Opportunity for them to have a, have a have built for themselves. They don't want handout. No, no, none of them do. Just give me an opportunity. I might be having some shortcomings, but I will, I will, I will catch up. I will get there. Just promise. I promise you, I will get there. Just give me an opportunity. In a silent way, that's what they're saying. These two girls, absence of their mother, by themselves in a foreign country that they never thought that they would be, because they had an access to a job, and because of that job, they had an access to a community, some other ones that come from other parts of the world, and some of them has been in Idaho for 100 years of their, of their family journey. They get a car, they get better, they bought the house, they get better, one of them start the school at night, college, they get better, and then one of them said, okay, I'm going to go full-time because they got a scholarship, because her grades were so amazing. Before that, we were sponsoring Team USA, the Olympic team, and there was an Olympic game in Brazil, and from our factories, we pick so many workers with their families to go to the, where the Olympic game is so they can cheer for Team USA there. And the, everyone in the factory anonymously picked these two girls to go to Brazil and cheer for Team USA which they did. And the other one did the same thing, and they both moved on and flied out. And they, one of them finished the university in an honor degree, and the other one is in the middle of it. So, when they asked the sister and they said, where is your family, where is your mother, where is your dad? The, girl, the woman who picked her in Ukraine is, is Jewish uh, refugee organization, is married to a Christian guy in Ohio, and they adopted them in, a, in, a, you know, in an emotional way. And they says, she says, oh, my mom is Jewish, uh, my dad is Christian, and I'm Muslim, and I work at Chobani. <laughs> and this is in Twin Falls, Idaho. This is, this is real. I, I got to know this country really well. And I know we're going through a massive amount of disagreement, what's going on out there, and it hurts me, it hurts me dramatically. But this country matters. Twin Falls, Idaho matters. Upstate New York matters. This, this, this town matters. But what matters the most is this country gave all of us, including myself, to reach out to our dreams that it was not possible anywhere else around the world. And, and we owe that, we owe that. And, and I think what I, if you ask me, and Elliot, uh, uh, I, I wanna finish it with this, with this note. I know this crowd, these people here, are innovators, forward-looking people, and they know what the world needs to be con you know, shaped around this connectivity. This consciousness. I have on that a 20 second final question, which is when before we came on, Shira made the request of this national campaign, will companies give maybe a partial day off or a full day off at elections? And you, you know, unprompted, you said you thought it was really Amazing interesting. idea, and I'm gonna do it. Thank you, Shira. Let's give a huge round of applause. This was incredible. Hamdi Ulukaya. Thank you.